Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started here. So um, I'm Alison Hall. I'm co-moderating here with uh, Dr. Daniel Kolansky, and we're going to introduce our panel. Um, we've got Dr. Sehan Sevik, apologies for pronunciation, Dr. Konstantinos Saratakis, uh, Vladimir Dazvik, Fazal Latif, and Tony Spady. So welcome, everybody. With that, we'll invite our first speaker to come up to the podium, Dr. Ahmad Awad, uh, Trissing with Ping Pong Technique in Retrograde CTO with All the Tricks. Sounds exciting. Uh, so uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we have this gentleman. He's 51 years old. He's diabetic, hypertensive, dyslipidemic, scarring, heart disease, plus history of left male LED stent, complaining now from chest pain, Canadian classification 2 to 3. Uh, then routine ischemic workup was done at the following. Uh, he had a, a, a ST segment depression in the lateral leads. His echo showed ejection fraction between 50 and 55 with regional one motion abnormalities, and there were no uh, remarkable laboratory investigations, so uh, coronary angio showed the following. Left system showed osteal LCX CTO with patent sense in left main LED. RCA shows patent stent and distal borderline lesion with retrograde filling to the LCX. So uh, lift, lift system was engaged using XP 3.5. BMW wire was advanced in the uh, first OM supported by a small balloon. Still no flow anti-gradely in the first OM. PTCA to OM. Faint anti grade flow in the first OM. Then multiple PTCA until uh, first OM appears. Contralateral injection from the RCA shows retrograde filling to the uh, LCX, which, which uh, was totally occluded. Uh, here we have the OMI wire and the RCA cyan black wire was advanced retrogradely through epicardia collaterals, wire advanced, till uh, it reaches the osteal total LCX with another BMW wire in the LED. Uh, Corsair Pro 150 advanced through RCA cyan black wire. Cyan black reached side of LCX total occlusion. Then uh, here comes the puncture. Try to enter LCX with micro catheter support. Then exchange it with Gaia 3 to puncture through the proximal cap. Negotiation through LCX proximal cap. Succeeded to puncture with micro catheter support. Advanced distally in the LED the Gaia third wire, exchange it with uh, RG3 wire, and trial to return back in proximal LED and left main and succeeded, the RG3 wire. So uh, we have to enter the XP 3.5, succeeded. Then we have two uh, PTCA to proximal LCX through the RGA wire, RG3 wire. Multiple PTCA, LCX started to appear. Multiple PTCA wire, and we have two BMW wires in the LED and first OM. LCX appeared. So long stint in the LCX with uh, 3.5 balloon in the left main LED. Stent inflation to restore the flow in the LCX. Side branch optimization. Then kissing with a balloon of left main LED. So we have good results, but compromisation of osteal first OM occurred. Left main LED and first OM kissing. Then PTCA to the first OM again. Then another kissing with left main LED and first OM. So a uh, passage of the balloon through RG3 wire in the LCX integrately, ensuring no affection of the osteal LCX stent after last casing of AM with LED, uh, and uh, showed very minimal protrusion of the stent uh, of LCX inside the left main. Post dilatation of the LCX stent. Another dilatation. PTCA to the OM again. Casing of left main LCX with uh, the uh, first OM. We have here good results. So uh, first OM wire removed. 
Microcatheter advanced through the epicardiac collaterals to go through left system. RG3 removed and exchanged with the BMW wired, uh, BMW wired integrally in the XP uh, 3.5. Reverse tip in with the BMW wire in the XP 3.5 after removal of the RG3 wire. BMW wire advanced distally in the LCX and microcatheter removed. Rewire the first OM through another guiding ping pong technique because we have no uh, uh, ten, uh, eight French uh, guiding catheter to support uh, and to accommodate all the balloons. And PTCA to left main LED. All these PTCA were done with DCBs. PTCA to first OM1. PTCA to the LCX sequentially. Left main LED and OM the first casing. Second casing left main LCX with the first OM. Then the tracing with three balloons through two guiding catheters being bong technique. Good results. PTCA to mid uh, first OM which was postponed until we finish the left main issues. Good result with the small hematoma in the mid uh, first OM. PTCA to the distal LCX also. And this is a hematoma. Pot, flare, and the final results. Note the proximal left main non limiting flow dissection under the stent and mid first OM hematoma. The final results. The take home messages you have to have a very good imagination. Never to try retrograde approach until you fail integrally or you have ambiguous cap. Expect the complications and their management. The most important is to put a plan. Thank you. Just a question. Uh, were these uh, seven French guides to begin with in both left main and uh, RCA, or six and seven 90 centimeter guides, or what size guides were you using? The old guiding catheters was, were seven French uh, she's, uh, guiding catheters. Yes, the old. I was just, just going to ask. So, beautiful case, a lot of work. I don't know how long that took or. Uh, that. I want two and uh, two and a half hours. That's, that's yeah. a. That's pretty quick. Um, and you also said drug-coated balloons were yeah. used. Uh, is that here in the United States? No, it was in uh, my home country, Egypt. Okay. Yeah. I was just asking someone today. What I know they cost a lot to get started here, but yeah, I know uh, they're a lot less. I understand. Yeah, uh, we 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 are using the coated balloon and the coronaries. Um, I think uh, five to six years ago. Wow. Okay. Did you use imaging at any point in your left main and your bifurcation or trifurcation stenting? No, unfortunately, uh, well, we was intending to use IVIS, but it was not present at the same uh, time of uh, working. I just had a question as well. Your initial, um, I'd have to look back at your original films because we had to go a little quickly, but um, your initial occlusion was osteal cirque, essentially the, the Ramus and, or high OM and the LED were patent, right? So was your initial stenting strategy there a tap in the cirque and then it just didn't entirely work out because of the shift of the plaque or were you expecting to have to deal with all of the branches from the very beginning? So uh, when, uh, when I started to open the LCX, so uh, everything can be expected. So uh, we, uh, the whole team in Al-Azhar University in uh, Cairo, Egypt, uh, wanted to have a final result with uh, a three vessel uh, of uh, good flow and uh, total revascularization. And just quickly, any comments about the small hematoma in the OM or the left circa, the left main uh, dissection that was present? Uh, we, have, um, uh, we, we, we have done uh, coronary angiography again after six months when the patient complaining from a minimal chest pain and it was a small purpose to uh, angio again and everything went super normal.
So if I can just ask, um, the flow in the OM at the end of the procedure was was not really there distally, right? And did, did that improve over time? Was it Timmy 3 in the entire vessel on follow-up? Yeah, uh, it was a compromised uh, uh, at the end of the procedure because of the small hematoma in the uh, mid first OM. But when, uh, after the control angio, after six months, it was pretty good. Okay, would have been nice to have seen that. Yeah, yeah I know, I know, but uh, I, I, uh, I, <coughs> it was I, I thought, um, you know, I wondered if the procedure could have been a little simpler. You had Timmy 3 flow in that OM about halfway through the case, and then you did a whole bunch of kissing and ballooning and stenting, and it seemed like the flow did not improve, maybe. Um, I, I tend to accept a decent result in an OM like that, not, not a perfect result, and yeah, I would certainly would have done the, the, uh, the uh, DCB that you did, and we've probably had DCB for 10 years or more, um, but I'm, I'm not sure if I would have done all of that triple uh, kissing. <laughs> that would, that, that's just how I, I might have dealt with it. Thank you. Okay. Great case. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, we're going to move on. Our um, second case is going to be presented um, by Dr. Chevik, uh, and it is titled IVIS Guided PCI for Left Main Coronary Obstruction Due to Lung Tumor Mask Compression. Um, thank you, Dr. Chevik. My pleasure. Is this how you open yes. up the slides? Uh, I'm Gian Chivik, uh, one of the interventional cardiologists in Colorado Springs. Uh, this case is performed in uh, Istanbul, Turkey. So Dr. Tigan is on his way to uh, come to Denver. <laughs> I'm filling it in. Anyways, this is a 62-year-old uh, gentleman with known uh, lung cancer admitted to the hospital over there with COPD and uh, some metabolic issues, hypercalcemia, and he developed uh, chest pain and elevated troponin during the hospitalization. Um, uh, based on this EKG and elevated troponin, uh, he was taken to the cardiac cath lab. Um, his RCA is normal. You can see his left main is like that. So there is a severe stenosis in the left main, but the imaging is highly sus uh, suspicious for an external compression of the left main from an outside mass. It's pretty tight. So patient goes to CT scan and uh, it clearly demonstrates uh, that he has a, a lung mass compressing his left main. So they take the patient back to the cat lab next morning. So at this point they did a heart team decision uh, they talked to CV surgery, obviously, uh, what to do, cabbage versus PCI. Given the patient's comorbidities, they opted for uh, PCI. Uh, they IVUSed uh, the left main. Initially, the IVUS catheter did not pass through the uh, stenosis. Uh, they predilated this area with a three millimeter balloon and then IVUSed uh, the uh, left main. You can see I was just, uh, going through pretty easy now. Um, at this point, there was a, uh, these are the IVUS images. Uh, IVUS images are uh, clearly different from IVUS images uh, that we see day to day in our cat lab. This is not an atherosclerotic uh, lesion. So you can see from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock, uh, it's a uh, dark, image, which is the tumor mass, which makes the sizing of the left main challenging because we don't know what is the size of the left main. Um, so they, they measured the size of the LAD and they used the formula to uh, kind of uh, approximate the left main size. And at this point, they were also thinking about either crossover stenting the left main into the LAD versus just the shaft stenting. 
but they decided to proceed with crossover stenting to kind of wedge, wedge, the, LA, uh, wedge the stent in the uh, LAD so that it won't migrate backwards or forward. Another challenging uh, thing here to think about is they did the path from proximal to distal so that uh, it did not elongate the stent uh, into the aorta. So they started parting the left main stent from proximal with a 5-4 balloon. The stent was a 402 and 8 drug eluting stent. They have a great result. They re it. Decent opposition. I think they re after this. They took multiple pictures. We talked about the challenges in this case. Um, these type of cases also, oh, you can see on the CT scan that the tumor is compressing the left main right there. These type of cases uh, can also happen in patients with severe pulmonary hypertension, especially uh, after chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension cases with the dilated main pulmonary artery compressing the left main. So he asked me to present this case uh, to follow the original case. This case was uh, a patient with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hi hypertension, severe pH, and uh, osteal left main compression. Uh, the operator here decided to just stand the uh, shaft of the left main and ended up eventually migrating the uh, stand proximal to the aorta. Uh, therefore, this particular case was a teaching point to them, so they did the uh, next case in a crossover stanting way. Um, key learnings, IVUS is helpful. Um, definitely extrinsic compression is different from the atherosclerotic coronary artery disease, uh, and uh, they recommend these type of cases should be treated with crossover stenting versus shaft stenting of the left main. Thank you very much. Thank you for presenting that beautiful case. Um, maybe we'll start down at the end of the panel. Um, Vlad, you do a lot of uh, left main and bifurcation work. Um, couple, any comments on this? Uh, would you have approached it with a single crossover? Would you have thought about uh, other approaches for um, uh, stenting? No, I think focusing on the first case, uh, beautiful result. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions, I guess. Um, I, I would have wanted to know, and I'm not sure whether you mentioned what the plans were for the tumor itself. Um, you know, is, is this going to be treated surgically very soon? Is there going to be um, uh, perhaps radiation or chemotherapy to shrink it first? How long do we have for DAPT, right? So and I asked this question to the operator. This is a type of stent. We don't have it in the United States. It's basically a 4028 uh, Chinese stent, which, is, which has a different polymer, and it is indicated for one month DAPT, actually. So there, the polymer, the pores are different from our commercially available stents in United States. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about the prognosis of the patient, but it's a, I assume, with a 62-year-old smoker, yeah. Yeah. COPD, lung adenocarcinoma, not, not great prognosis right there. Well, well, there are stents we have in North America that do have a one-month indication, it's right? True. So uh, both uh, the Medtronic stents, the Onyx, and, and certainly probably the Zion stents could also be used one month, I think there's data for, for both. So I don't think that's an issue. Radial strength is, is a bit of an issue for me because um, how do we know that this tumor just isn't going to continue to compress this left main? I, I would have really explored the option of a mid-cab, uh, which, which doesn't require cab, uh, which doesn't require DAPT. Um, but, you know, as a beautiful result, it, your question whether... Uh, this should be a crossover, two stent, definitely crossover, and that worked out really well. I think two stent complica complicates it even more in terms of duration of DAPT. Um, 
if there's going to be chemo involved, there are going to be all kinds of hematological issues, and you want the patient off DAPT at that point, so we don't know the timing of all of that. Yeah, yeah. great points. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely um, echo uh, Vlad's comments about the complexity of the case. We, we deal with these kind of cases uh, in Houston, uh, given our, um, you know, next to MD Anderson, we get these patients all the time. And I, I think at least for us, very important to be like a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, so we, we speak with oncologists and then we take it from there because if there's no plan to treat that mass, if you don't know how they're gonna treat that mass, the dual antiplatelet therapy, even one month sometimes it, it is an issue. Um, and I don't know, interesting question for you or the panel or anyone in the room uh, regarding, like if you were in North America and you decided to put a stent, would you put like a thin strap, would you put like a synergy with more radial force, what would be your guys' uh, option? So I was actually thinking about that already because I thought to myself, well, is the mass not just going to compress this as well? But I don't know the exact features of the stent when that was put in, and I agree with what Vlad said, you know, if you could do a minimally invasive Lima, that might have been nice, but maybe this guy just has a very dire prognosis, we don't really know. Um, but if I had to choose, I might have gone with a Megatron, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know what the, um, what the data are for one month DAPT, if, if that's what we're thinking, or we're not, we don't know what we're thinking in terms of that, so. Yeah, but otherwise maybe like an Onyx or Zions product, yeah. like you said. Okay, thank you thank so you. much. Um, we'll invite our next speaker up, uh, the perfect storm, Dr. Ahmed al -Bore. Thank you. So actually this perfect storm started, uh, okay, how to return. This perfect storm actually started with a sunny day in the beautiful Aswan uh, city. <laughs> when we have uh, a referral call from nearby hostel that uh, we, they have a 64 year old gentleman, diabetic and hypertensive, presenting with inferior STEMI and RV infarction. Uh, actually, we thought uh, there's a quick BCI before lunch, but this never happened. After gaining uh, radial access, we faced uh, marked subclavian torsuosity, marked difficulty in engagement of the uh, left coronary artery. But after a repeated trial, we managed to do a coronary angiography for the left system, which revealed proximal and the mid LED significant lesions. Repeated trials to engage the culprit right coronary artery, but we failed. There is uh, no one to one movement uh, of the uh, catheter. And then we uh, get back to uh, the arm of the patient we, where we realize the cause of this, which is uh, there's a kink at the catheter. After repeated trial to cross with, uh, with the wire, with the, even with guide wire, uh, we failed. And actually we realized that we have complete fracture of the catheter. After gaining uh, femoral eight French axis, we tried to uh, snare the uh, broken catheter, but it failed. If we remember the shape of the catheter in the previous uh, image, it is like the handle of umbrella. It has got uh, stuck at the uh, almost radial loop. So we do uh, an injection that reveals that we have uh, uh, maintained the flow around the catheter to the arm. So we forget something. We have a patient with a STEMI. So we back to the uh, right coronary artery, engaged with the Joachim right, uh, crossed with a BNW wire and BTCA, but we have TMI zero flow. And at this uh, moment, we have another strike from the storm. The patient arrested in VF with ROSC after uh, DC shock and one cycle of CPR in a heart block. So we inserted a temporary pacemaker. Uh, we injected intracoronary tyrofibane, repeated manual aspiration using the export advanced uh, catheter with slight improvement of the flow, but still we have habis thrombospiridin. In our center, we have a mechanical uh, thrombus aspiration device, which is angiojet. We used it in this patient with improvement of the uh, distal flow. At this moment, we have a catheter stuck in the patient 
uh, arm. So we uh, voted for stopping at this stage uh, regarding the uh, coronary and deferred stenting and back to uh, the catheter. But this by this time, we have our cardiac surgeon in the uh, cath lab, and he revised the study with us. And uh, he said that he is familiar with uh, this situation during harvesting the radial graft uh, during the bypass surgery. So it took him about five minutes to do small incision and to get the caster out. And here is angiography after uh, extraction of the catheter revealed, uh, maintained the flow to the distal tree in the forearm of the patient. On the next day, the patient was weaned from mechanical ventilation, uh, support, regained the normal sinus rhythm and temporary pacemaker wire was uh, removed, maintained on tyrofibin for 48 hours, followed by enoxaparin, and fortunately, his ventricle was uh, preserved. After uh, three days, here is the control angiography. I remember at this moment, I asked my consultant, should we go left radial? And he <laughs> stared at me. Are you kidding me? Go femoral. <laughs> and here is the control angiography. And we ended with a proximal standing and a distal DCB. Then a stand for the left, uh, until descending artery, followed by non-compliant balloon. And there is the final angiogram. So the learning point from this case, radial access is good, but not a holy access. Know when you should stop. Teamwork is important in complication troubleshooting. Expect the storm, even if it seems a sunny procedure. And thank you. Thank you very much. I just have a couple of questions and comments. So uh, that's a, a great case. Um, so. One thing, when before your catheter fractured, um, did you try to grab the distal tip with the snare and then try to unwind it in the arm? Did you ever get an opportunity to do we, that, or we, it just cracked right away? We did the, something uh, related to this concept. It was external fixation uh, directly on the uh, arm of the patient. But th at this point, the most important thing is to remember what is the last uh, movement of the catheter. Uh, is it, was it anti-clockwise or clockwise to reverse it? And actually in this scenario, never you uh, recall what is your last movement. I see. And one other question, um, just a thought. I think at one point when you were trying to snare it, you could see your two catheter ends were pretty close to one another. I've never actually done this, but I did read about a case where they took a coronary wire and wired into the entrapped catheter and inflated a large balloon and used that to pull it. So I don't know if that might have been another option. Actually, uh, th this might work if we don't have the umbrella-shaped uh, kink in the distal trap decaster, which is hooked inside what is like a radial loop. So even, even uh, when we uh, got the caster in the uh, snare, we can't move it at all. Okay, I see. Yeah, so it was hooked there uh, in the yes. arm. Okay, thanks. Any comments from the panel? Yeah, so it's, um, in my experience, the problem usually occurs if you continue to wind in one area, and th this happens with these very tortuous, tortu tortuous vessels. Um, I find that a stiff wire sometimes helps to turn to turn the catheter better in that situation. A big breath, obviously, uh, for the patient, that, that also helps. Um, and, and not to turn in the same direction multiple times. I think that's that's what causes this. I think there's a, you feel a difference if you're trying to unwind it as to whether you're winding it further or not. And you can just also, also see on, on the fluoro. So those are just some of the things, you know, otherwise if you get stuck in that situation, well done and uh, nicely managed. Thank you. Um, comments on the panel? Um, uh, Tony, sounds like you've got a comment. We had a similar case, actually, so I thought this would never happen to me, but it, it, uh, we had a catheter break off. I think you did exactly the right thing. You had a lot of clot in the right. You got a catheter stuck in the arm. Um, for our experience with the surgeon, was the same. It took him minutes. This was super easy for a vascular surgeon or a cardiac surgeon to make a small incision and pull that catheter out. You can, I think, your idea of wiring and putting the balloon or snare, like you tried to snare it, those will work, and we've had to do that, but... In this case, you got other problems with a STEMI and a lot of clot. Yes. And then you wait a few days, the clot's cleaned up, so it's kind of bonus for your, your intervention. Yes. And your arms had a little time to heal. Um, so I, I, I like that approach of not spending too much time working, worrying about the arm. Just let the surgeon have the arm later, fix the STEMI, 
and come back a couple days later. Wh where was the incision he made? Uh, ju just um, at uh, below the, uh, the, the, the forearm uh, line, at the, just one centimeter below the elbow. Got Dark. control and was able to then remove. Got control of the artery that was able yes. to remove. Yes. And I take it that the surgery was done post STEMI in the OR. Patient went to the OR and had surgery, or was it done in no, the No, no, on the table. On the table, yes. before the STEMI intervention? Patient already uh, mechanically ventilated after the cardiac arrest, so he's sedated, so uh, just uh, direct uh, incision. I don't know how many surgeons will touch that in the U.S. will tie off a band going and stuff like that. So. All right, any other comments? Thank you, really interesting case, perfect storm. Hopefully the weather is better. <laughs> Thank you. All right, our uh, next case um, is uh, an unpleasant surprise after aggressive stent uh, dilatation. Dr. Uh, Zeno Giannis will present. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for giving me the chance to participate and to present our case in CVI 2024. So our case is about a 77-year-old patient with a walking angina uh, who had the prior uh, successful RCA, RCA CTO PCI six months ago. So that's uh, the image of the RCA CTO. You can appreciate the proximal gap at the proximal segment of uh, the RCA. It's a long lesion, at least JCTO score two. And uh, this is the final result after uh, the implantation of four in total stents. It's a good uh, geographic result, and uh, the colleague who performed uh, the PCI also checked uh, his result, confirmed the good result uh, by doing IVUS, and he was really pleased with uh, his result. However, in our repeat angiography, uh, what we showed was uh, we noticed that there was, uh, in, in, in the circle, a uh, subtotal occlusion of the PLV, and uh, we had also the temptation to check uh, the result of the prior PCI with a new IVUS. And uh, what we found was that likely due to a positive remodeling, we had a significant stent vessel mismatch and um, malaposition. So our plan was to first initially fix uh, the lesion in the PLV with a uh, drug eluding DES 2 by uh, 20 millimeters and then go and do aggressive uh, dilatations using multiple non-compliant balloons up to six millimeters at the proximal, in the proximal segment of the RCA and high atmospheres in order to fix this mal malaposition. And uh, here's where the surprise came. So what we noticed, uh, we took that shot on the left side and we see this uh, image that is compatible with uh, osteal dissection of uh, the RCA, and most importantly, the, there was a stent that was missing. And where was the stent? Actually, it was uh, hanging uh, inside the ascending aorta. It was uh, over our guide catheter. So we had to have a plan here. Uh, one solution could be to try to remove the stent outside the uh, patient's body. But uh, I have to mention at this point that uh, this stent was a Megatron 4 millimeter stent and has already been dilated with a 6 millimeter non-compliant balloon, so it was like a large dilated stent, and uh, with a rough estimation, we would gonna need an at least uh, 18 friends access via femoral artery, and we thought at this point that we wouldn't do so. Uh, another option would be cardiac surgery, but uh, we're not at this point yet, since the patient had no symptoms and no major branches had been compromised so far. So we decided actually to uh, use a balloon, pull the stent as distally as we could, and implant it somewhere in the patient's uh, vascular bed. First of all, we had to fix uh, the lesion, that was the uncovered lesion in proximal osteal uh, RCA, and we did so by using a drug eluting stent, five by 28 millimeters, and we make sure that we fully covered uh, the ostium of uh, the RCA. And then we went for the, for the missing, for the dislodged stent. And actually, what we did, we used a six uh, millimeter non-compliant balloon, we cross the, the stand, the, the already dilated stand, and then we pull it and try to drag the stand as far as we could, as distally as we could, away from the major branches of uh, the aorta, like the uh, right subclavian artery and the right carotid artery. And when we felt that we were away enough, even from a uh, right uh, 
our mammary artery. Uh, we're pleased at this point, and we just uh, implanted the stent there. We used the six French non compliant, six millimeter non compliant balloon, and we dilated the stent and just implanted there. This is our final uh, shot. We're pleased with the angiographic result, and we confirm it by using uh, also IVUS that showed a good uh, expansion and position of the stent. And uh, we're, go we're going to my closing uh, slide and to the take home messages. So we should be expect an amount of uh, degree of uh, positive remodeling after a successful uh, CTO PCI that could potentially lead to stent malaposition and vessel stent size mismatch. Uh, also, you have to be prudent, not to be too enthusiastic as we are. Uh, we, I believe that the mechanism that led to this stent dislodgement was that we were, uh, performed actually uh, aggressive post dilatations in a malapose stent and uh, we didn't let enough time for the balloon to completely be deflated. So I, I believe that we pulled a semi-inflated balloon and that was the most likely mechanism of uh, the stent dislodgement and the deacetic aorta. Finally, you have to use uh, an algorithm in case of complications. Algorithms are very useful, but you have to be creative at the same time. And the uh, first option would be to remove the stand outside patients. But, yet, but if you feel that this is very cumbersome, you can uh, do alternative, you can use alternative option as uh, like implanting the, this lot cell uh, at the, the vessel, the different segment of the vessel of the patient, the distal, the better. Radial artery would be a good option, but the stand was already dilated, so we had to uh, implant a little bit more proximally. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Yosef, I've got a couple of questions. So sure. what was roughly the interval between the CTO intervention and this repeat intervention? It was about six months. Okay, that's surprising. So, um, and do you know if what their technique was? Were the, a lot of those stents placed subintimally or in the true lumen, or you're well, not sure? Uh, as I said, I wasn't participating in the, the first uh, in the first operation, but I think that he went for undergrade wire escalation. I'm not really sure if, uh, I believe that was undergrade wire escalation or were no stents uh, implanted subintimally, okay. to the best of my knowledge. Yeah. Thanks, I'm just asking, because it seems the vessel is huge, so I just wondered if there was some subintimal mm. uh, stenting or something, but anyhow. Okay, thanks, any comments from the panel? Yeah. So it looks like a short stent in the ostium, right? Like a 12 millimeter stent or something like that? Actually, it, uh, I noticed the report, I checked the previous report and it was mentioned there was a two by 38. Uh, that doesn't look so, maybe it, because it was like a, a lot of distortion of the stent, right? It was like kind of squeezed, as I see. Yeah, but I, I, according to the report of the prior operation, because I, I, this was my thought too, it was like a really short stent, but according to the report it was like 38 millimeter stent. Do you know if the second stand was larger in diameter than the one? Oh, the second, the, 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 the one that we used? Yeah, right. it was a bit larger, it was five, five uh, millimeter. I, I mentioned it somewhere because we had like the IVUS and uh, we could really uh, precisely si size it. It was a little bit larger than the previous one because of this Good idea. malaposition. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's a, it's a creative rescue, you know. In the early days of stenting, we would uh, have to crimp our own stents onto balloons, and we would lose them sometimes um, and have to place them somewhere else, iliac, somewhere wherever they sort of fell off. Um, and, and Taver, occasionally, you've got to uh, pull back a device and place it mm -hmm. uh, um, somewhere else. So I think it's a very creative and successful um, uh, approach to solve this problem. Really happy that I didn't experience the early era of uh, PCI. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so we'll move on to our next speaker. Uh, we've got coronary double dilemma, Dr. Zaid al Baje. All right, thank you for having me. All right, I have no disclosure except like I'm not working at Ford anymore. I already graduated and there's some of the things that will be mentioned that are off-label. Um, uh, I got a call from a friend in the, in the, in the community hospital that's not referring uh, to our uh, tertiary center. Um, said, Zaid, uh, I, have a, I have a double dilemma. I have a 77-year-old uh, lady who has uh, a history of uh, three-vessel disease. She has osteo-LAD, mid-LAD 90%. Actually, she has CTO of distal LAD, 
uh, her circus disease and calcified her RCA is CTO. She has chronically occluded right common iliac. She has like moderate reduced EF, um, hypertension, COPD. She also has like cervical uh, cancer that was uh, in remission. Um, she came to my clinic with um, with uh, worsening shortness of breath. She was always short of breath. We uh, we attributed to the COPD, but now she's uh, minimal activity will cause her shortness of breath. And um, they uh, did an echocardiogram, and uh, they saw that her LV function has dropped significantly. And now that uh, she has this um, LV thrombus in the apex, is probably there's mural, mural thrombus like uh, uh, um, on the anterior wall as well. Um, this big thrombus looks pedunculated, and this lady is like, I have to admit her from the clinic to the hospital. She's on IV diure diuresis, but we just cannot go anywhere with her. I, he called the surgeons in his hospital. They don't want to touch her. They said, like, uh, good luck with that. I'm, we're, we're not going to do anything. Um, so it was like in Michigan, usually, like when, when things like that happen, they sent to Henry Ford. So they called, uh, they called me, and uh, I, I, got to, I, I went to my structural um, uh, attendings and my uh, CTO attendings, Dr. Alaswad, and uh, it's like, okay, let's, we, I have this, uh, this case. Uh, what are we going to do about it? Um, the, my friend sent me the angiogram that he did, and this shows the RCA. Uh, CTO also shows the uh, critical left main, distal left main stenosis, the calcified proximal circ, and the, and the LAD CTO. Uh, there's some collaterals from the left to the right system. Um, so she's not a surgical candidate. We contacted our surgeons. They said no. Uh, the LV apical thrombus became an, an issue. Uh, the left main three vessel severe disease. Uh, she spent five days in the cardiac ICU on medical management. Hopefully that we actually were waiting for MRI for two, two reasons. We wanted to see if there is any viable myocardium that we can intervene and benefit her um, because we know that the apex where the thrombus is is probably dead myocardium. Uh, the other thing is that the structural people wanted to, to know the characteristics of that uh, LV thrombus. They said um, we, we, we need to know if it's really pedunculated, how, mu how much of it. Sometimes if we do any sort of intervention on that thrombus, we, we, um, we um, usually remove the stable tissue and, uh, and there's un like unstable tissue that causes more thrombosis. With the stroke risk, what are we going to do? Um, should we uh, proceed with the high-risk PCI? Should we remove the LV thrombus? Should we do both? Um, separate or together in the same procedure or medical therapy, hope for the best, maybe just anticoagulation and hospice, <laughs> I don't know. So that was, that was all discussed in the cardiac ICU, the uh, anesthesia team, the cardiac surgery, structural and interventional team. Um, eventually, because we were not able to get her out of the ICU, she was still on high flow nasal cannula on IV diuresis, um, we decided to go ahead and do both procedures at the same time. So we did TEE-guided uh, transeptal approach. Um, this is the transeptal approach with the BRKS L1 system with a balloon septostomy with a Armada balloon. We had an, in the, vein, in the right femoral vein, we had a 26 um, French um, uh, gore dry seal um, sheath, and within it, we put an angiovac um, catheter. Um, with the TE guidance, we were able to steer it into the um, LV uh, through the mitral valve, and then we did uh, multiple passes of the uh, uh, of the angiovac. Uh, TE was guiding us through like how much of the uh, thrombus we can we can take. Of course, to pro uh, to provide embolic protection, we put a sentinel device. Uh, to, uh, to prevent any embolization to the carotids, to the brain. We thought that um, now that we have most of the LV uh, thrombus is, uh, is taken out with the angiovac and she had the embolic protection, um, to make sure that she would never, uh, she wouldn't have more clots in the future, at least we need to um, get the, uh, the left main and the proximal circ open because that's what the bank for her bucks for, will be. The LAD, we just did a star with a Gladius Mongo. We tried integrated wire escalation. With, we reached a, a radar wire, but then like was, it was like in the subintimal space, so we went with a Gladius Mongo, knuckled it, and, uh, and got a star. Um, you can see the difference between the left and the right pictures. The aortic valve is not opening on the left because she went flatline at some point when, with, uh, with the PCI of the left main. So we had to do the PCI really quickly. At the same time, we had a, um, now if you remember in the presentation, she had a chronically occluded iliac artery. So the left artery, femoral artery is the only option. So we had a, an eight French guide 
and we also had a, another um, uh, sheath in it that we up, uh, uh, upsize it to a 15 French, and we changed that, and that's the off-label part, we changed that, uh, the angiovac cannula into a tandem system, so it's connected uh, so, so the angiovac cannula is in the, in the left uh, atrium and then connected to the uh, pump and then the, and the blood returns through a 15 French. So it became a tandem. We did not have the luxury of time to switch to a lava ECMO or change the cannula or change it to a, like connect an oxygenator and change it to an ECMO. So tandem heart is all we had uh, with this cannulas. Then we did a uh, PCI of the left main to the circ with a uh, 3.0 by 28 megatron and then TM protrusion, uh, protrusion for the LAD to the left main. Um, and uh, this is the final results. Uh, so we, we see that even um, with that uh, intervention, the aortic valve start opening and the LV function has improved in front of us. Um, and uh, she was able to tolerate weaning down and decannulation in the same case. Um, she was, uh, she went to the ICU, she, she, she remained on a uh, uh, ventilator uh, support for a couple days. She was extubated, um, the actually extubated the next day. And then um, that was the case in March. She was continuing to recover in the ICU. I checked on her two days ago. She continues to follow with my friend uh, in the community. Um, she's in good health, but still no one wants to touch the RCA CTO or doing anything. Her LV function has improved to about 30%. She doesn't have any LV apical thrombus anymore. She's on chronic dual uh, dual um, uh, DOAC. And uh, yeah, that's my case. That's, uh, that's quite a case. Let's open it up to the panel um, quickly to go down the line. Uh, comments uh, I would ask about uh, uh, was removing the LV thrombus. Um, is it, was that necessary? Was it uh, appropriate and helpful? And any other comments? I missed the part of cardiac MRI. Did you do the cardiac MRI? She couldn't tolerate it. She couldn't lay flat for the cardiac MRI. We, she was not able to leave the ICU. She was on high flow nasal cannula and IV diuresis. And I have a question um, regarding the, you know, definitely a very challenging case and you know, the low EF. Have you guys thought maybe to put here on tandem from the get-go? Um, I mean, this looked like a case that you definitely needed some support. Um, and it sounds like that you waited until, you know, um, middle of the case when she crashed to, to put you on tandem. If I would say maybe, you know, from the get-go, decide and put you on tandem and do your procedures. So access-wise, we were ready for the tandem, but we would run out of room in terms of the transeptal. This is like angiovac cannulas are big, uh, big cannulas to do to go transeptal, so putting a, a tandem. So we had to do... What the window of time we wanted to switch the, the angiovac to a tandem, that's why we had the dry uh, gore dry seal sheath so that we have the sheath access, but we didn't have the time, she flatlined, so we had to use the same cannula as the tandem. Why did you guys think that, you know, why you felt the urgency to, to take out the LV clot? I mean, many times you have people with LV clot, we treat them with anticoagulation for a yeah. while. I mean, definitely great job if there was nothing left. I'm just trying to understand why the urgency. When we had a hard team approach, uh, we were split 50-50. 50% -50. 50 uh, people said, just give her uh, anticoagulation, do the PCI, and um, hopefully like, she, she wouldn't have like, any embolization. I think the structural team has uh, recently published a case series of 30 cases of LV thrombectomy, um, and uh, they were encouraged to do that. They also saw that um, a pedunculated LV apical thrombus in the presence of left main PCI, and we saw that in, like, in, in one of the slides, how the LV function improves dramatically with the LV um, restoring revascularization of the left main, and they worried that that alone can cause embolization, uh, transient like embolization of the clot. Again, these are off-label, but that's, that was the the thought process behind it. And I think, I think six or seven attendings were involved in this case to just make the decision. As I said, no one would touch her till now. Yeah, very, very interesting case. Uh, to me, the thrombectomy was very novel. Uh, I didn't realize there were 30, it was a 30 case case series, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I would guarantee that there still wouldn't be residual thrombus after the thrombectomy. Um, did you have, what was the right radio like? And I, I think you went through the femoral for the PCI. We put the sentinel through the right radio. You did? Yeah. Okay, okay, good, 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 excellent. Yeah, we so, were yeah, running so out you, of access. So you had room for tandem. Again, I would have gone with the tandem up front. In, in this kind of case, you had almost no circulation. So probably would have uh, prevented 
the collapse. I'm sure if you had the tandem going. One of the main the issues we, we face is that the, the lava ECMO, which we do uh, quite a lot, is like it's a, it's a side hole catheters, but the, the angiovac is an end hole, so it has a lot of suction on the wall, and also like uh, we have to make sure that it's really positioned well, because if it pulls back to the, to the right side, we'll have a deoxygenated blood going back right. to the system. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank great, you. great case. Very challenging, uh, inspiring. Um, okay, uh, Dr. Ali uh, will present the next case. Um, swinging in the breeze, distortion of migration of the LAD stent. Yeah. Hi, afternoon. Thanks. Just uh, okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, have the opportunity to present our case. Um, perhaps, unfortunately, I do not have any disclosures. So our patient is a 62-year-old gentleman who's referred to us with CCS2 slash 3 angina, despite being on a couple of anti-anginal agents. Um, he had positive uh, treadmill test and he was referred to us for invasive coronary assessment. I should note that uh, he'd been recently diagnosed with prostate cancer and was being considered for curative uh, treatment. Uh, no LV assessment prior to being referred to us. So these are our uh, initial diagnostic images. They confirm a proximal LAD CTO, and the distal vessel really does not reconstitute very well. Uh, we could see a fairly sizable, probable diagonal branch that was filling retrogradely, so potentially something to work with uh, if, if we decided to proceed with any revascularization. The right coronary artery had some moderate disease, uh, and once again confirmed that there were really no um, uh, retrograde collateral supplying the distal LAD. We did a quick LV assessment with the VGRAM, uh, and that confirmed that he had essentially preserved LV systolic function, no significant wall motion abnormalities. So now we have a bit of a dilemma. What do we do? Do we stop in trial medical therapy? Do we refer him for cardiac surgery? Uh, do we stop uh, and stage this as a dedicated CTO procedure? Or do we proceed with PCI in the same setting? Uh, there might be some disagreement, but we, did, we decided to proceed. And, and really, we, had, we felt fairly solid reasons. So the gentleman was quite symptomatic despite being on a couple of antianginals. He had a positive stress test. Um, the lack of collaterals and distal opacification meant that he probably would not be a surgical candidate. Uh, but perhaps most, most importantly, the attending in the lab was a very experienced and se seasoned CT operator and thought that we could take this on. Um, and then, of course, you know, we felt there was a need for definitive management given that he was due to have uh, curative cancer treatment. So uh, I should mention that, you know, at this point we had a six French system by the right radial. So we used a turnpike spiral and a gladius wire and found ourselves uh, in a septal. Uh, we've got quite a lot of experience using the angle Suzuki dual lumen catheter in our center. So we used that to wire into a distal vessel, the angulation and anatomy of which kind of pointed to that diagonal that we'd seen earlier. A little bit of gentle predilating later and there was some flow down the LAD. Uh, and once again, using that Suzuki dual lumen, we were able to wire into the LAD proper. So going well so far. Um, now, we did an IVUS run. Unfortunately, I don't have the images because we were trialing a new system. Uh, but based on, on the IVUS, we decided to do a balloon crush kind of bifurcation strategy uh, PCI to the LAD diagonal. Uh, so we deployed a Zions 3 stent in the diagonal, and we jailed that behind a further Zions 3 stent in the LAD back to the LAD ostium. Um, we we rewired the diagonal with a view to doing a final kiss with two NC balloons, and this is probably where we started running into a bit of grief. Um, so we had a six French system, we were trying two NC balloons, and it was a, a big struggle getting it up there, but you know, after a bit of valiant effort, we managed, and managed to do a, a good uh, kiss. And onto the home stretch, um, we thought. Um, but unfortunately, this is where really our troubles began. We had a lot of difficulty removing our balloons, our wires, regardless of whatever we tried, we simply could not um, uh, move the balloons at all. There was a significant amount of equipment interaction, uh, and we thought at this point we have no option but to remove the whole system and upsize. So that's what really what we did. But when we took the seven French uh, catheter, 
we noticed, and, and I apologize if the images haven't come across very well, it was very difficult to see in the cat lab, but we noticed that there was a mobile linear density kind of dancing around in the aorta. Um, and when we tried kind of exploring this in a little bit more detail, really our worst fears were confirmed because the LED stent looked like it had been pulled back. It looked very mangled and distorted. Uh, and we confirmed this with an IVAS run into the circumflex, which, which showed a lot of LED uh, stent materials protruding back into the, uh, into the left main. So now we've got the case of a distorted stent that has been pulled back and is kind of dangling two or three centimeters in the ascending aorta. So, so what are our options? Well, we can try and snare the, the stent. We could try and crush it against the aorta with a TAVI balloon. Uh, we can try for a surgical opinion. We could try conservatively managing it. We could try jailing it behind the left main, uh, with a, jailing it in the left main, sorry, behind another stent, and accept that you know, we'd have a free segment in the aorta. Well, we did try and snare it, and uh, perhaps I can talk about this a bit more in the question session, and we didn't really get very far. But after discussing it with kind of a lot of other interventional colleagues who were kind of peering in uh, from the control room, we decided that the best strategy here would be to try and wire back into the LED and to jail the stent. Um, so that's what we did. We took a turnpike spiral and, and wired the LED with some difficulty with a gladius, exchanged that for a wiggle wire for some extra support, and then jailed that distorted stent behind a 3-5 Zions in the left main. Now, the, uh, the, the diagonal, unfortunately, at this point, looked fairly precarious. Um, and we thought we had no choice but to try and rewire it again for a final kiss. Um, we did that with some considerable difficulty, but then managed. And at this point, we were sort of patting ourselves on the back, thinking, you know, great, we've done a good, good job, good angiographic result. But then for the life of us, we, we couldn't see the, the migrated stent in the ascending aorta at all. And our worry at this point was that, you know, have we fractured it and has it embolized? Um, we kept an eye on the patient for a few minutes. He remained stable. And then what we did is a CT chest. And, and much to our relief, that confirmed that there was about a two centimeter stent uh, uh, kind of hanging out in the ascending aorta. Uh, final couple of slides. The patient did well. Um, he remained stable. Uh, we did a CT brain just to make sure we weren't missing anything. And he was completely well. Now, he had a, an uncle who's a cardiologist um, in the States who discussed it one, one, with one of his surgical buddies who said that, I think this ought to be removed surgically. Um, so we referred it to our, our surgical colleagues who said, you know, we're happy with conservative management. The patient was happy with that as well. Um, very limited case reports related to this. And unfortunately, I, I'm not sure if I uh, should own up to this, but actually we have a case report from our own center from a couple of years before, uh, where a stent that had been implanted about 10 years before was incidentally found to have, uh, have migrated as well, and actually the patient was fine. So we think overall the, the outcome here is likely to be benign. Um, so the key reflections here are, is that, you know, if you're going to be doing bifurcation PCI, do yourselves a favor and use a seven French system. Um, I think the other kind of reflection we took away is that after rewiring into the side branch, doing routine intracoronary imaging just to confirm you've not gone substrut is probably important. Um, and yes, uh, we, we think our patient will be fine. Thank you very much. That's the case. Thank you. I actually definitely agree with some of those points you made at the end. I think when you're starting out with a case like this, you've got a CTO and a potential bifurcation intervention. You definitely want to be at least seven French uh, size guide. It'll make your life a lot easier. The other thing maybe to think about was you, I don't think you had a dual setup for retrograde injection. Granted, you got lucky and you did wire readily, but something to consider as well. Um, I was just curious, what wires do you, did you have in when everything got stuck? Do you remember? Uh, yes. So we had a, um, just if I re recall correctly, we had a Gladius in the LAD um, and a um, Gaia second in the diagonal. Okay, thanks. Yeah, because certain wires are a little bit more prone to getting stuck and yeah. married with the balloons yeah. as well. So We just um, switched supplier to a new kind of new NC balloon supplier. And, you know, the, we wanted to sort of see how the NC balloons interacted in the six French system and unfortunately ran into quite a bit of trouble. And uh, did, you didn't make any attempt to snare at any point? We, so we did, yeah. So okay. the, uh, the talk was, was going to get very long, but we did make an attempt. Unfortunately, it was a very short ascending aorta, and I think the anatomy acted against us. We had a long debate amongst ourselves about whether we just go femoral and try and snare it, but our worry was twofold. Um, number one, I mean, it was a fresh stent, so theoretically it would be easier to snare, but we were worried we'd unspool it. Um, and just make it longer. And I think, in, in fact, I was looking at the presentations from last year, and that was one of the cases presented at CVI. 
uh, last year. And then the other worry was that the significant interaction of the diagonal stem. So we didn't really want to distort that in, in any case because it was a fairly sizable territory. Um, so yeah, that's why we we've, were dissuaded from further attempts there. Any comments from the panel? Nice uh, result in the end. Um, I, I think this case kind of illustrates to me the perhaps the pitfalls of doing a, a case like this ad hoc. And so even from the point of view of informed consent, your discussion is going to be very different, I suspect, once you know that there's a CTO. And then there's no way that you're going to make the patient aware of all the potential uh, complications that occur or the incidence of those complications are going to be very different than when you're doing a regular diagnostic with the possible PCI. I expect so from that perspective. Also, not doing these ad hoc, there's nothing wrong with taking this patient off the table and bringing him back in short order for a planned PCI. It would have gone seven French right away yeah. and would have um, obviated uh, all, all of this uh, trouble, I suspect. Now, final thing, you mentioned that at the end you had trouble rewiring. Um, I didn't see, and maybe you just didn't show it, uh, pot technique used at any time on that bifurcation. So to me, when you're doing uh, any kind of a crush, DK crush procedure, um, you have to do a, a pot in two instances, immediately after crushing, because if you don't, then you're not going to have good access to the to the side branch. So pod will immediately improve your access tremendously. And the second time to do the pod is when you've delivered the main vessel stent. And I'm not sure whether you did that or not. We did, it was just for okay. a yeah. time Fair issue. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So I, I, if I run into this trouble after I've potted, I repot. That's the only other thing. Yeah. And oftentimes at higher pressure and oftentimes it gets better. Thank you. Thank you, great. Great description. Um, I don't know if Dr. Agarwal is here. Um, do we have your case uploaded? Yes. Terrific. Welcome. Uh, welcome again. Yeah, hi. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to the organizers. Um, so, uh, so our case, uh, it was a case which went, um, uh, we had to require, think out of the box and um, uh, at every step, at every minute to bail the patient out. Um, uh, just a disclaimer, this was performed by my attending. Um, how do, uh, uh, oh, oh, right. I have no disclosures. So 79 year old lady with past medical history of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, class three, uh, presented with progressively worsening chest pain to ambulatory class four for three days. Uh, pertinently, she had a history of abdominal aortic aneurysm uh, post uh, prior AV EVR done a couple of years ago and a carotid stenosis in the right ICA, which was also uh, for which she underwent an endotric trick a couple of years ago. So given the uh, worsening symptoms, uh, an EKG was performed when the patient came to the ED, which showed uh, ST depressions in the infralateral leads uh, with some uh, T inversions in one and AVL. Blaze 9 echocardiogram was normal. Uh, so given the symptoms and the EKG findings, patient was planned to be taken to the cath lab. And this was the uh, angiogram performed of the left system. It was a left dominant system. Uh, we can see that uh, the left main was slightly short. Uh, there was a mild osteal disease noted in the uh, osteoproximal disease in the LED. And there was a proximal uh, uh, LCX 90% disease with, um, and we can see there was an atiatic segment in the mid part of the stenotic uh, segment. Um, uh, we did the uh, IOS runs. Uh, the, on the left is the LED run, and we can see there was a certain amount of calcium in the plaque, but it was mild. Uh, so it's, I think, running a little slow, but uh, it extended up to near almost to the ostium. Uh, the minimal lumen area of the LED was around 7.8 uh, millimeter square, and uh, really it was not uh, uh, noted to be very significant. Uh, and the reference diameter was around 3.5 millimeters. Uh, in the LCX front, we can see the lesion was pretty tight as we go approximately. This was actually performed after plaque modification because I was, was not able to go through uh, with this tight lesion. Uh, and we will just now see, we can see here that it was a big aneurysmal segment. It was more than four millimeters. The distal reference was 3.5, proximal was around four. And we can see the lesion was pretty tight and very calcific. 
Um, so, um, so we thought of proceeding ahead with the PCI of the LCX. Uh, as we can see, so we used a six French EBU 3.5 guide. Uh, we used a run through wire. Uh, we initially uh, modified the plaque uh, given the amount of cal calcium. It was easily modifiable with a 2.5 millimeter and followed by a three millimeter balloon, uh, non-compliant. And subsequently, we performed a PCI with sequential overlapping stents of 338 and 3.5 15-millimeter stents. And they were post-dilated with a 4-millimeter non-corrine balloon. We, uh, the operator went a little, uh, uh, um, they were enthusiastic. They uh, uh, did a high-pressure dilatation near the ectatic segment up to almost 22 atmospheres. And uh, uh, initially, uh, so we can see the final. This one, uh, this was before the post-dilatation near the ectatic segment. And following dilatation, uh, immediately we had this on the uh, on our hemodynamic tracings. We could see some evidence of pulses paradoxes, and obviously we encountered an LCX perforation class three with cavity spilling. Uh, immediately, so this was the challenge. Immediately, balloon tamponade was performed with a 3.5 15-millimeter balloon, but there was continued extravascular flow, and it was upgraded to 4-millimeter balloon. Uh, immediate pericardial access was obtained. At this time, patient uh, had a, uh, went into cardiogenic shock. Uh, 50 cc blood was evacuated, and it actually improved the hemodynamics. Uh, and subsequently, patient actually did not encounter any shock. So at this point, we were uh, debating about obtaining an alternative access for ping pong delivery of the covered stent. And uh, different accesses were considered. So we performed an ultrasound guided right CFA access. However, we encountered a distal aortic occlusion in the uh, EVAR site, and there was no further options of temporary MCS requirement if we, end, if we, if we ended up requiring it or guide delivery. A left urinary access was also obtained, and we encountered a left subclavian stenosis preventing guide delivery. And emergent cardiac surgery uh, uh, consult was placed who deemed patient not a candidate for ECMO or emergent bypass. So, uh, so, the, so it was thought that uh, uh, at this point that uh, the only option we had was to do a rapid deployment of the covered stent. So uh, given the amount of calcium that was there, it was very difficult to deliver the stent immediately. So we used a balloon assisted tracking with the guide liner and the balloon. And subsequently, two covered stents were deployed. So the initial stent that we used was 3.526 papyrus. It went easily across the lesion, but it was thought that it was not covering the entire perforated segment. So we thought we'll uh, take the 426 uh, uh, papyrus as well, and that went. Uh, but the, there was a difficulty in advancing the papyrus, uh, the proximal part. But however, it was able to reach up, almost up to the just uh, post ostial uh, in the LCX and was rapidly deployed. Uh, no contrast extravasation was noted, and there was no residual pericardial effusion. We are happy with the result here. When we pulled the catheters, uh, the, the guide a little behind just to take the uh, another uh, angiogram, we found that there was this another challenge that was awaiting us now. We found that uh, the LED ostium was not filling properly, and there was a, a question that there was a disruption of the LED ostium. Uh, we did an uh, um, IOS as well here. Uh, I do not have the image for that. And it did show that there was a presence of an osteoproximal LED dissection um, at this point. So we had to place a minimal wire in the LED. Uh, uh, we performed an initial kissing balloon. We used the initial I was, uh, 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 we decided the balloon based on the initial I was sizing. We used a, uh, we formed on the kissing balloon with a simultaneous 315 uh, non-compliant balloon. As we can see on the left, uh, uh, we took the balloon inside, did the final, uh, we did a uh, uh, kissing, and we were able to establish flow in the LED. And subsequently, the LED stream was stented with 3.515 millimeter DES, and the final kissing balloon uh, of LED and LCX was performed with V-stent technique. Um, and this was the final result. Uh, the stents were exactly at the ostium. The left main was okay. Obviously, we, there was some plaque in the left main, but uh, we were happy with the overall result. Um, we can see uh, the 24 hours later, patient did not have any uh, pericardial drain, which was subsequently removed. During the entire procedure, barring the first event, there was no further uh, development of hypotension or cardiogenic shock. Patient already did the procedure well. Uh, LV function continued to remain normal uh, even uh, till the time of discharge, and patient was discharged uh, after three days. So uh, the learning points for the team were anticipate the unexpected and prepare for every scenario. Navigate with care, respect vessel tortuosity and calcification. We are always enthusiastic in treating these lesions, but we need to curb a little bit and uh, do what is best for the patient. 
Uh, when we encounter such complications, uh, the uh, interventionist has to be uh, familiarized with his CAT lab hardware, know with what uh, toys he has to uh, treat these uh, complications. Precision matters, as mentioned, avoid oversizing balloons in the calcified segments. Plan ahead, always have a contingency plan in place for challenging situations and find the silver lining. Opportunities await even in the most difficult circumstances to treat the, uh, whatever complications you encounter in your cases. Thank you. Um, congratulations on a really nice rescue, very difficult situation. I mean, I think it points out the challenges, uh, first of all, with the calcification to atrocities, mm -hmm. you said, and as we saw in some other sessions earlier today, it can be very difficult to deliver covered stents. Uh, the papyrus are better than the older versions, uh, but still often need a guideliner, um, need to be prepared. And then mm -hmm. I think, obviously, you got stuck with the uh, a dissection from either guide or from the uh, uh, delivery of the papyrus stent, uh, but you rescued it. So um, remarkable. Um, uh, just con my congratulations. Let's see if the panel has uh, comments or thoughts about how they might have done it differently. I'm not sure about the V stenting, the left main LAD osteum circumflex. So it's, it was almost like a four and a half hours case. Uh, obviously, uh, we did on the initial IORS and did find some plaque in the left main. Uh, but at the same time, um, this was the best option uh, to perform given we almost had the covered stent almost exactly till the ostium of the circumflex. Uh, so it was thought that, and given the patient was stable, uh, it was thought that best. In fact, this patient is actually planned for, this was done approximately three months ago. There's actually planned to do a check angiogram at six months. Uh, just to be sure everything is going fine for the patient. But yeah, uh, uh, a little pinch of salt, but obviously we do agree that I think this was the best strategy we could do for the patient. I mean, it's a nice bailout sort of rescue um, uh, in a situation like this. It can be deployed quickly, and it's mm -hmm. uh, rather than having to do DK crush or something for the left yeah. knee. Yeah, so really, really nicely done. Uh, very complicated case. Uh, I don't have an issue with the V if you have a normal left main or larger left main then those two balloons combine and if you can do the V that way in this kind of an emergency case I think that that works well and uh, after four hours it's probably better than a, a DK crush at that point. Um, I think at least in a couple of instances I saw a couple of segments I saw calcified nodules and those are a harbinger of bad outcome and uh, it, it's I, I'm more attuned and more aware of them more recently and um, you probably have to modify those. Otherwise, if you even if you don't oversize your stent, I think the balloon's going to go towards that calcified. That calcified nodule may very well be what what perfed that yeah. vessel. I don't know exactly how you do it. Uh, there's some data for a lithotripsy, but probably a combination of lithotripsy and maybe rota. Uh, definitely not orbital because that's going to dissect the opposite side. So just a couple of comments on, on that, what, what may have actually triggered this. Um, one more quick comment that we, we don't want to overlook the fact that was a massive dissection, a massive perforation. Yeah. And so all else being equal, um, as we've, we've talked about in some other sessions, um, promptly getting ready for, for uh, support is, uh, yeah. is the right answer. Surgical support, MCS while you're preparing yeah. uh, to try to get a, uh, a covered stent down there. Um, you ran into the problem of the occluded aorta, which you, no one was expecting. Um, you didn't have preoperative uh, CT planning, et cetera. Um, so an unfortunate um, aspect. But in general, you would want to be thinking very quickly about um, uh, support um, while, yeah. you, um, uh, while you tackle this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Issam Ali, to talk about narrow escape from death. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Dr. Asim Ali, Interventional Cardiology Fellow from National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases, Karachi, Pakistan. I'm presenting an interesting case aptly titled A Narrow Escape from Death. I have nothing to disclose. <clears throat> so this is a case of 65-year-old female with hypertension and scoliosis presented to us with chest pain for two days. Her ECG showed ST segment depression in inferior leads with raised drop eye and diagnosed as non-ST elevation MI. 
Her echocardiogram showed mild LV dysfunction. She was vitally stable, so we decided to proceed with coronary angiography with intent to revesc. Her RCA was non-obstructive. Uh, the operator had difficulty in engaging the left system through radial axis, therefore switched to right femoral axis, and the left system showed severe tubular lesion in the distal cirque. Well, uh, it seems like a simple procedure where it was decided to fix the distal cirque. For this procedure, EBU356 French guide catheter was taken. Despite some initial difficulty, the operator managed to engage the left system. However, when attempting to cross the wire into the cirque, it was noted that it is totally occluded at the ostium. Here, the operator suspected that cirque had been dissected during the wiring. So to address this, a protection wire was placed in the LED and second wire was taken for the cirque. Then it was ballooned at the ostium, but flow was not achieved. Here we encountered, uh, uh, at this stage, we encountered a critical situation as the patient became significantly hypotensive and there was no flow in the left system. Here it was identified that there was a left main dissection which the operator initially didn't recognize. Now it was decided to proceed with the stenting from left main to LED and here uh, the stent was placed from osteal left main to LED. Here comes another clinical challenge. Despite stenting, flow was not achieved. Initially, the operator suspected slow flow and treated it with intracoronary medication, but flow was not maintained. So what to do next? Here our team took the charge and we decided to do IVES. Uh, what IVES revealed was striking. The stent was full of thrombus and adjacent to the stent dissection flap was noted and true lumen was also identified indicating that the stent had been placed in the sub-intimal space. Now, our primary goal was to get flow in the left system. We took pilot 200 wire and negotiated it first past the stented segment to get flow in that artery. Here in this picture, you can appreciate the dissection flap extending all the way from aortic cusp down the vessels. Here is another interesting finding. Uh, the case is actually full of challenges. The artery we re-entered was actually the diagonal, and the stent had been placed across this diagonal branch, and the lumen of the LED was jailed by the displaced intima. And the stump of LED was visible. Now we decided to re-enter into true lumen of LED. So uh, for that, we took pilot 200 wire, and here's a beautiful picture depicting successful re-entry into the LED. After that, flow was achieved. To maintain flow, initially it was ballooned with 1.5, then upgraded to 275 for optimal expansion, and as a result, flow was established across both the LED and the diagonal. Following this, the stent was post-dilated and port was performed. Now our goal was to get flow down the circ. The dissection flap was extending all the way down the artery. So uh, for again, uh, we took pilot 200 wire and got into OM by star technique and flow was achieved. At this stage, patient's pressures improved, symptoms subsided, and TIMI3 flow was achieved. Now we decided to end up uh, our procedure here. Uh, these are the final result. By successful re-entry into the LED, diag and circ, flow was established in the, uh, across the left system. Immediate post-PCI ECG uh, showed some ST segment elevation that were resolved next day. Uh, at follow-up, after two months, CT angiography was done. Uh, you can appreciate the dissection flap at the left coronary cusp. The good thing is flow was maintained down the LED uh, dike and cirque. These are some additional images with same finding. Uh, the patient has been on regular follow-up for last five months, is asymptomatic, and her ejection fraction improved. So the key learning point from this case, uh, the first point is there is no word like simple PCI. And one must always be careful while engaging the coronary arteries, especially in short stature or with the spinal deformity. And early detection of left main dissection is very crucial. Always confirm position of guide wire in two orthogonal views. And early use of imaging technique can provide crucial insight into the underlying mechanism. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think we all have a number of comments. First, um, first rescue. Um, I, I think the first lesson, obviously, is that this was a left dissection of a left main um, dive induced dissection that occurred yeah. very early. You could even when your surf, uh, when you notice the surf was occluded, there was filling defect. There was filling uh, 
um, there was filling abnormality exactly. already in the um, uh, at the origin of the left main. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, let's just unpack it for a second. It looks like then uh, the next, the first stent was placed, but it was placed subintimally, not in the true lumen, correct? Exactly. Um, because of the dissection. Mm -hmm. So lots of challenges mm -hmm. um, here. Yeah, I, I actually was just going to say, first of all, I mean, thank you for presenting this because this is a real bit of a disaster case and it can happen to any of exactly. us. And we'll talk more about the management, but it's it's brave to present that. So good for you. So uh, how did you manage that, uh, uh, those LED stent that was in the subintimal space when you went behind the stent? Did you just crush the stent with a new stent into the LED or how did you restore flow in the LED? Uh, we just ballooned it. We didn't put a second stent. You see, so there is a stent just, in the LED in the yeah. subintimal space, yes. but the real lumen does not have any stent. Yes, uh, the real lumen does not have any st stent. In f huh. we, just, we just ballooned it. In fact, we tried for KBI, uh, tried to deliver two balloons simultaneously, but we had difficulty. Already we had a bad day, so uh, I think it was not a good idea. Flow was maintained. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to... <laughs> just wanted to comment the uh, on the first picture where your first guide shot your guide you know points up and so you're mentioning it's a small lady but if you see that in a big person or a little person you need a new guide so you need a bigger guide so if exactly. you have a three five yeah, yeah. use a four the or three seven five uh, it, sh it should be more coaxial you'll exactly. be less likely to get because mm -hmm. you it's easy to dissect if you're not if you're pointing up on the roof mm -hmm. and uh, but still an amazing save and then uh, the starring of the cirque is nice. You got flow again. Mm -hmm. And then the key is not to have anybody tempt you to stint that cirque. Yes. It won't make, the you won't feel any better about it at the end. Exactly. Thanks. The plan is to bring the patient back, or have you already uh, brought we did the patient back? CT coronary angiography after two months. Uh, I have showed the images. Uh, the flow was maintained in the LED diag and cirque. Still, we can appreciate the dissection flap and the left aortic cusp. So the patient is stable, uh, and patient even uh, does not want any uh, invasive procedure after that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's see, to close this out, we have one more uh, case from Dr. Pham, a high-risk PCI with the novel Self-Expanding Supira PVAD for support. Dr. Pham. All right. Last case. Hang in there, everybody. All right, so uh, uh, my, let's see, go back. Well, anyways, my, that was my title, High-Risk PCI with Novel Self-Expanding PVAD here in my disclosures. And so our case is an 83-year-old woman, um, came in with chest pain, Cath revealed three vessel coronary disease. She has some hypertension, otherwise some prior tobacco use, but nothing else. Um, her labs were grossly normal or benign overall. Uh, surface echo showed an EF of about 45%. There was some uh, anterior wall hypokinesis and some mild uh, valvular insufficiency. They did a uh, perfusion study which showed some viability of the anterior wall. And uh, surgery was consulted and they declined uh, surgical revascularization due to poor distal targets. So then she was referred for high-risk PCI. Here's her diagnostic cath. I won't go through the whole thing, but you know, as you can see, there's a focal nodular calcium uh, at the mid-segment, right at the takeoff of a rel relatively moderate caliber acute marginal. Um, as you, you can see some faint collaterals filling the left at the end of the films. <clears throat> Here's the left. As you expect, there's a CTO of the left circ, as well as a CTO of the mid-LAD with bridging collaterals and left-to-left -left collaterals. They also did a CT abdomen pelvis for three cons that showed extensive uh, ileal femoral as well as iliac disease, and that'll come into play in a little bit. Um, so procedural plan, after much discussion, uh, the overall plan was gonna be rotational atherectomy of the bid right, uh, followed by further lesion modification, and then ultimately uh, uh, IVS guided PCI with overlapping stents, and then attention will be turned to uh, PCI of the LED CTO. Uh, there was you know discussion about doing complete revascularization, but you know, given the complexity of the case, I think they deferred uh, left circuit canalization. And I think in these particular cases, you know, for most of us, um, our next discussion is, does it pay, you know, should we use MCS? You know, I was uh, fortunate to work with Dr. Reginald Lowe, who is a proponent against really MCS for early training because he 
tends to tell me that uh, it uh, takes the sport out of PCI. But I think for us young folks, I think we need that extra help. Um, but you know, things that I've been told to consider when we think about MCS, you, know, you really have to think about patient factors, what are the hemodynamics of the patient, um, what's the anatomical complexity, and then operator experience. So in cases of her, she's an octogenarian, she's had a prior MI, she has you know, moderately reduced EF, and then you know, she's essentially a single remaining vessel, given that you know, she's got that RCA really supplying some of the collaterals, although there are some left bluff collaterals as well. So not entirely single remaining, and then operator experience. And in this case, uh, operators of the case had extensive experience in perk bad. Um, however, you know, um, traditional uh, commercial devices, I think, were prohibitive for her given her earlier femoral disease. And so that's, that's where the system comes into, uh, into play. Um, currently in early feasibility studies, or at least first in human experiences, uh, it's a 10 French delivery system. It, it expands to 22 French, so a single probe glide provides excellent hemostasis. Um, there's a self-expanding impeller at the proximal portion. Uh, it's encased in a nitinol cannula, and I think on some bench top studies, there's a lower degree of hemolysis. And the great thing about this, uh, this uh, perk bat is that it provides up to five and a half liters, so it really extends the gamut of all current commercial uh, percutaneous uh, ventricular assist devices, and it's also through a rapid exchange delivery system over an 018 wire. Um, and then additionally, there's some pressure sensors along the distal and proximal portion of the device, so it really provides real-time hemodynamic monitoring. And so here's the device coming up, getting unsheathed. Um, there's a lot of uh, sort of a intrinsic friction in the device, so very short throws, uh, but you know, with some elbow grease, you can get it through, and you can see it starting to slowly expand right now through the shrouds. And then there's the impeller that's at the proximal portion that's coming out. And so after uh, several runs of rotational atherectomy, this is the, the polishing run. Um, we're able to deploy two overlapping drug eluting stents. Uh, you, you'll notice there's a kind of gelled off that acute marginal, but there is some bridging collaterals that are forming early on uh, that'll fill that vessel. And then here's the real-time uh, tracings from that case where you start to see the beginning of the rotational atherectomy run. You'll get decreased pulsatility and then essentially loss of all pulsatility. MAPS maintain in the 80s, very consistent. And then uh, towards a longer run, you can actually see uncoupling where there's essentially the device is providing essentially all of the perfusion. Once the rotation atherectomy runs are stopped, you can start to see the patient gain more pulsatility back again. MAPS have all been in the 80s at the entire time. <clears throat> so then we turned our attention to uh, the CTO of LED. Uh, we used an ADR technique, re-entered distally, and then we're able to deploy two long uh, overlapping stents. Um, there was some lo loss of two small diagonal branches. And then, as with many CTO procedures, you'll see a lot, you know, you know, Timmy two and a half flow or so with some, you know, really underfilled distal LED, which presumably over time, I think will probably plump up. And then here's the removal. So very flexible system, so it really just comes out quite nicely. I think this is probably my favorite Sydney is just the resheathing of the device. So conclusion, you know, we know that uh, MCS for high-risk PCI is increasing in use over the last decade or so, and I don't see that uh, changing you know, one bit. Um, unfortunately, I think five-year trends regarding major vascular, vascular complications are relatively constant. You know, and, and as you know, the larger the bore, the higher risk of uh, vascular complications, um, you know, despite contemporary ultrasound-guided you know, large-bore access, you know, there's still complications. And so this you know, device hopefully will provide or at least try to address some of those issues. And it's a smaller, lower profile 10 French system um, with flows up to the current 5.5 system. And then you also get real-time LV AO pressures. And so first in human experiences are ongoing and the EFS studies are beginning this year. So with that, I just wanna thank, uh, you know, Dr. Abazad, Campos, and Casa, the facilitators, uh, and they're hosting us in Brazil, as well as Dr. Latif and Kadali from New York and, uh, and my, uh, my mentor, Dr. Singh uh, Davis. Thank you. Yeah, that was a beautiful case. Thank you for sharing it. Um, I, I just want to make one comment. I think the pre-procedural planning slide was maybe the 
was one of the more important things that we've seen. Um, this is a obviously very challenging case, challenging patient set at 83 years old, et cetera, multi-vessel disease. And I think that really taking a deep breath, making sure this is shared decision making, and then and then pre-procedural planning with uh, mapping out the coronaries uh, is really the critical, uh, the only way this was going to succeed. Um, so congratulations. Um, comments from others on the panel here? Um, just one question. Um, very uh, excellent case and presentation. Um, I'm not sure what you'll practice about putting a temporary pacemaker when you um, do a rotoblader of the RCA, especially a CTO on the other side. I, I know they've looked into this and you don't definitely don't have to, but um, given the CTO on the other side, maybe that's what the only thing I would have done differently. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Um, I think uh, in uh, the my, my program, um, it's been sort of standard practice to use a temporary remains pacemaker. Um, I think there's I think in the, the Sky Fellows course a few years back that I went to, I think that was actually changing and there's some folks that actually don't use it at all and will just, you know, pre-medicate the patient. So, yeah, so aminophilin is obviously used by yeah. some. Um, uh, I think a, a, a temporary pacer is the most definitive, but um, either one. I, <clears throat> I agree. I was going to say uh, we quit using it quite a while ago, yeah. but we used the bradycardia as our barometer, so a little <laughs> bradycardia. We stop, let them, and it works. Ver it, it works, I think, quite well. Um, I am curious what ADR technique you used for the LED. Was it a star, basically? Yeah, essentially it was a star. Um, uh, I don't think that they had the. Uh, I don't think that they had the uh, stingray balloon available. The one, the one thing I used to hope for that kind of result to it'll plump up in a few months, but but now we have a lot of data on a on a star case like that that you stent and leave alone, and it has Timmy grade flow. And it's like the number one predictor of a, a long occlusion the next time you look. Yeah. So it's, uh, they, they don't tend to plump up if they, I mean, it, it kind of gets you out of the lab. I, I would say most of the time if we star one like that, like 99.9% .9 of the time, if it's a long subintimal distal reentry, try not to stent. Just even Actually, if you have Timmy one flow or no flow, just investment. balloon it, investment, leave them alone. Definitely. Sometimes a marker of non-viability, right? If you, if you get poor flow, yeah. Any nice final comments in this case on the report? Where do we get one? <laughs> <laughs> um, to be determined soon. I think, uh, I think with the, uh, the FDA sort of, uh, uh, I don't know if it was a recall, but it was FDA statement regarding uh, perforations of the LV um, with the Impella CP that kind of threw uh, planning a little bit. I think the planning of, of uh, this device is kind of, you know, there's some there's some issues behind that. Is it a U.S. company? What's that? Is it a U.S. company? It is correct. It's okay. a part of the Shifa Med Group, so okay. they sort of a innovative hub with a lot of a, a lot of devices being developed. Great. Well, we are at time. Thank you very much. A spectacular uh, ending to a great series of cases. Nice to see new technology as well. So something to look forward to next year. You can come back and give us the uh, update on the, the uh, uh, superior device. Um, with that, we'll thank the audience and the participants, uh, and we'll close the challenging case competition. I'm going to ask the panel to stick around for a couple of minutes.